morning, God's tribe. It's wonderful to be with you from Nairobi, and we are really looking forward to joining you in Dar es Salaam soon. Well done for getting going with our Sunday services again. Uh, so encouraged to hear of how the first one after a few months went. Please excuse the cap. Uh, my hair has been falling off as I've been going through uh, my radiotherapy and chemotherapy treatment over the last several weeks, and I think it will be a distraction if I was to uh, let you see it. Now, if you were asked the question, uh, here is a blank piece of paper and compile a list of things that you would really like, what would you put on that list? Ladies, maybe for you a handbag, men a man bag. Uh, I got one recently for Father's Day, they're pretty cool. Um, or maybe you'd want the recipe from your favorite restaurant. Yeah, like those really nice ribs that you get when you go there. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you feel like you need a holiday. 2020 has been tough, it's been difficult, and you just need a break. Uh, or maybe you need a, a second chance at something that hasn't gone quite right. Not sure. You know what you'd put on that list. Would healing be on that list for you? Certainly for me, the year I've had, healing would be somewhere on that list. I'd be saying, please, could I be healed of brain cancer? You may have gone to doctors looking for healing. You may have tried medicine looking for healing. Or you may have tried both. Uh, maybe for yourself or for someone that is close to you. And my hope today is that as we look to the Word of God, faith would rise, that God's Word would speak to our hearts, uh, God's Word would stir us to action in this area of healing, and that we would be empowered to see the sick healed. We are in part five of our series in the book of Acts, and our passage is taken from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. And it gives the account of a miraculous healing of a man that was born lame. You may recall that the book of Acts was written by Luke. Now, Luke was a medical doctor. At the end of his letter to the Colossians, Paul refers to Luke as our dear friend Luke, the doctor. So medicine and miraculous healing can complement each other. And Luke carefully records many miraculous healings in his gospel, as well as in the book of Acts. But he didn't stop being a doctor. In some ways, miraculous healing is more straightforward than medicine. It doesn't have the side effects of medicine. Often medicine will give relief, but it won't give complete healing. And medicine can be costly, while miraculous healing is a gift from God. And Luke captures some of this when he describes the woman who had the discharge of blood for 12 years. In the ESV translation, we read in Luke 8.43, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Very honest from the good doctor. So while medicine is good, sometimes it can go only so far. So let's trust God for more miraculous healings where he heals directly and completely. Let's turn to Acts chapter 3 and we'll be reading from the first verse. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, 
but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk taking him by the right hand he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong he jumped to his feet and began to walk then he went with them into the temple courts walking and jumping and praising God when all the people saw him walking and praising God they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called beautiful and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him while the man held on to Peter and John all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's colonnade when Peter saw this he said to them fellow Israelites why does this surprise you why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. What a dramatic passage. What an amazing piece of scripture. And friends, there are three things that I want us to draw from it. Firstly, the beggar's life was transformed. This man went from being lame from birth to being healed in an instant. In chapter 4, we read that he was over 40 years old. Imagine being lame for over 40 years. For some of that time, his family probably cared for him. And it may have gotten to a point where his family couldn't do that for him any longer and he had to find a different way to live he had to live as a beggar and every day he was carried to the temple gate called beautiful to beg for money from those going into the temple courts one commentator says this is quite strategic because as as the people are going into the temple courts well they're, they're going to worship God they have something to give they're probably feeling more generous as they're thinking about what God's done in their lives. So this was a strategic place to be as a beggar. That was his life, expecting to receive money from others. It reminds me of the lame people that we have in the city center of Dar es Salaam, many of them. And I have given money to some of them on occasion. And honestly, it can be overwhelming. And sometimes you feel... If I could do more, if there was more that I could do for these people, I would do so. On this particular day, the life of this beggar was going to be transformed. Peter and John were entering the temple courts and he asked them for money, as was his standard practice. He was a beggar. And Peter says, look at us. And he does, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And instantly, immediately, the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And he went into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. His life was never going to be the same again. He had experienced the power of God. He had experienced the power of Jesus Christ. His life was transformed. Now, there's nothing wrong with receiving money. If we just dial back one chapter to Acts chapter 2, we see the church living as a community. And one of the things that happens there is they, th those who had sell their possessions and it's distributed among the community so that those who don't have, have something as well. There's nothing wrong with helping in that way. That is biblical Christianity. But for his situation, for this particular man, what he got was better. It was more transformational. He received health. He could walk. He could jump. He could praise God in a way that he had never done before. 
And it's reasonable for us to assume that he put his faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins, the deeper sickness that affects us all, the sickness of sin. As we will see, his healing was an opportunity for Peter to preach the gospel. It is reasonable to assume that he joined the church. I mean, here he is holding on to Peter and John. He probably said, yes, I want to become part of this community. And maybe someone in the church says, hey, I'll take you under my wing. And now that you can walk, now that you're able, let's, let's find a way to, to empower you to do a business, to start something, to generate an income. His life was transformed in some way or the other. His life was never the same. Dear friends, God transforms lives. What does rise up and walk look like? in your life, in my life? Is it literally physical healing like this beggar? God can do that. He can transform your life. Is it a paralyzed mindset that keeps us from fulfilling our potential? We need a shift in the way we think where they're just kind of waiting for something to happen and God is saying, hey, come on, rise up and walk, do something. Is it rising from the paralysis of sin? that keeps us separated from God. Well, believe in Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Him. Trust in Him. Come as you are. So that's the first thing is that we have a God who transforms lives. Secondly, God heals. He's able to heal and He wants to heal. This man went from being a cripple for over 40 years to standing up, walking, and then going into the temple courts, jumping and praising God. God healed him in an instant. It reminds us of the invalid in John 5 that would go to the pool of Bethsaida. And in an instant, after 38 years, Jesus heals him. His life was transformed. From the Old Testament, God makes it very clear that he is able to heal, that he wants to heal. Exodus 15, the people of Israel have been miraculously delivered from captivity in Egypt and they've crossed the Red Sea. They're coming into the promised land, moving towards that. Three days later, they begin grumbling. They're grumbling about water and God graciously provides. And then he says to them, If you're careful to observe what I have commanded, I will not inflict you with the diseases that I inflicted on the Egyptians because I am the Lord who heals. I am the Lord, your healer. We see God bringing healing through his prophets. Second Kings chapter four, there's this Shunammite woman and she has a son. The boy gets sick. He has a problem in his head. I I can relate with that. Maybe you've got a problem in your head. And he falls into his mother's lap. He dies. She connects with Elisha and Elisha raises the boy to life. In the next chapter, we have Naaman, the commander of the Amos of Aram. Great military man, but he suffered from leprosy. And again, through Elisha, he's told to go and dip himself in the Jordan River. And he's washed clean of his leprosy. In Isaiah 38, King Hezekiah gets a visit from the prophet Isaiah. And he's told, King, you are going to die. Put your house in order. And Hezekiah cries out to God. And God says, I'm going to give you 15 more years of life. The king is healed. Luke chapter 4, as we get into the New Testament, records that Jesus began his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit, that he taught in their synagogues. And his teaching amazed those in Capernaum because he taught with an authority that they hadn't seen before. After leaving the synagogue, he goes and he heals the mother-in-law of, of Simon from a high fever. And then at sunset, The people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. 
and demons came out of people shouting, you are the son of God. And the next day, when the people tried to stop him from leaving, he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, the good news of the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God came in a way that it had not been experienced before. The rule, the reign, the power, the dominion of God came in a way that it hadn't been experienced before. And he says, I need to preach that because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And in the next chapter, a man with leprosy falls before Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reaches out his hand and he touches him. And, and back then to touch a leper, lepers were outcasts. They were outside of the city. Jesus reaches out and he says, I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left that man. God is able to heal. God wants to heal. James Hill Augie said, Christ is the good physician. There is no disease he cannot heal, no sin he cannot remove, no trouble he cannot help. Preaching and healing went together in the ministry of Jesus, and they continued to go together in the ministry of his first disciples. And this should continue with us 2,000 years later. John chapter 14, Jesus said, whoever believes in him will also do the works he did and even greater works. Part of that works is this ministry of healing, seeing people delivered from sickness, from disease, from demonic oppression. The disciples had received power from the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost as recorded in chapter 2 of Acts, and we see the continuation of the sick being healed, not only here in chapter 3, but as the book of Acts progresses. In 1 Corinthians, Paul explains that God has given the church spiritual gifts, and that these gifts are given to the church until Christ is revealed, until Christ returns. From the time of Christ's ascension, to the time of Christ coming back, that period which we are living in now is a time in which spiritual gifts will be at work in the church. And in chapter 12, it picks up on this topic. To each one, the spiritual gift is given for the common good, verses 9 and 10. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another miraculous powers. And in chapter 14, he says that we should eagerly desire these spiritual gifts. So they're a gift from God, but our posture is we desire, we long for God, even as you are distributing according to your grace. We're in a place of expecting, desiring these gifts. The healing of this beggar came about because of faith in the name of Jesus. And faith is mentioned there as one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. When God heals, faith is important. Going back to our passage, verse 16, listen to the words of Peter. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him, that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Peter and John could not take credit for the healing of this lame beggar. It was because they had faith in the name of Jesus that the beggar was healed. It is because of the power that is in the name of Jesus. The power is with God. That's where they're giving credit to. And praise God that faith is a spiritual gift that we can desire. Praise God that He gives faith. Even when our faith is little, we can say, Lord, help my unbelief. Even faith the size of a mustard seed, God can use. And praise God that faith grows as we hear His word. 
when that woman with the discharge of blood had touched the edge of Jesus' cloak and having fallen before Jesus because Jesus had perceived that power had gone from him. This is what he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. We contrast that with Mark chapter 6, which tells us that Jesus was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. And he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. May faith rise in us. May we grow in faith. I do want to end this point by saying this, however. Not everyone gets healed. Even where there is faith, sometimes God will not heal. Perhaps you have prayed for someone or you've prayed for yourself and and healing has not come. My mother-in-law, she had a stroke over 12 years ago, which left her paralyzed and unable to speak. And we've prayed many prayers. Her grandchildren have prayed many prayers. Lots of people have prayed many prayers, but she has not Up until today, she's not been healed. There is a purpose when God chooses not to heal. And he can decide to reveal that purpose if he wants to. So, for example, we read in 2 Corinthians 12 that Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. Why? Well, to keep him from becoming conceited, to keep him from becoming proud. And he pleaded with God three times to take that thorn away. But God said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We're not told exactly what that thorn in the flesh was, but it sounds like it was some physical ailment, something that affected his body, something that affected his health. This is the same Paul that taught this church in Corinth about miraculous powers, about the gift of faith, about gifts of healing. This is the same Paul through whom God did extraordinary miracles of healing according to Acts chapter 19. Matthew Henry puts it this way. Sometimes Christ sees that we need the sickness for the good of our souls more than the healing for the ease of our bodies. God doesn't always heal, but we still go to him and say, Lord, you transform lives. Lord, you are able to heal. The third and final point to draw out from this passage, dear friends, is that healing is an opportunity for the gospel to be preached. There is this deeper sickness that I alluded to earlier, the sickness of sin. When Jesus said it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, he was referring to spiritual sickness, the sickness of sin. Listen to what Peter said following the healing of this man. Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. And jumping down to verse 17. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. 
Peter explained that God, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, healed this man so that Jesus would be glorified, so that Jesus would be honored. This Jesus is the holy and righteous one, and you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. The resurrection is true. The grave could not hold him. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God that the prophets of old spoke about. Repent. Change your minds. Turn to God that your sins may be wiped out. A very similar message to what he preached on the day of Pentecost, as we see in Acts chapter 2. And reading on into chapter 4, persecution comes from the religious establishment. Peter and John end up in jail. But despite that, many believed. The number of men, we're told, increased to about 5,000. When people are healed physically, which is amazing, which is great, which we are trusting God for, Let's trust God for more. Let's trust God for the message of the gospel to spread to those who are not yet followers of Jesus. So that the deeper issue of spiritual sickness, the deeper issue of spiritual healing will also come. Friends, as we've looked at the word of God this morning... My hope is that you will see that we serve a God who transforms lives. A God who is able to heal. And that when he does heal, what an opportunity for the message of the gospel to spread. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for every single person who has been part of what you have allowed me to share today. It's by your grace, God. Lord, may we grow in our faith. Lord, I pray that today gifts of healing, gifts of faith, gifts of miraculous powers and other spiritual gifts that are needed to build up the church, would be released by the Holy Spirit. That those who already have gifts of faith would start to exercise them, to fan them to flame. And that new gifts of healing would be released today. We pray, Lord, for the sick, for every condition, every type of sickness that is in this place today. And we ask that in the name of Jesus, healing would come. That healing would come. That sicknesses would go. That demonic oppression would be broken. That every manner of disease would be healed. Our hope, our confidence is not in our own ability. It's in the name of Jesus. And that as healing comes, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, would be glorified. Jesus would be high and lifted up. And Lord, we also ask that today, if there are any who are not following Jesus, who have not yet come to a place of surrender, that they would put their faith in Christ, that they would choose to follow Jesus just as they are, that they would surrender to His Lordship, Seek him for the forgiveness of their sins and follow him with all of their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.